and we're so happy to have you join us this morning. Uh, you know there are many things going on today, and I hope that we're, this is just one of the first of your uh, events as you move through the whole day here at the Wolfson campus. Uh, I've been asked to uh, let you know that we need people to become friends of the book fair. Uh, there are um, thousands of people who are involved in financing and working at this book fair. Uh, and you can, this year, you can actually text book at 501501 to make a donation, and we need your donations. We also need to recognize the sponsors. We have the Knight Foundation, OHL Arellano, and the Bachelor Foundation, and many more. Uh, the book fair events continue throughout the year. This is not the only time when things are happening uh, in connection Sorry. with the book fair. <laughs> at the end of this presentation by our three authors, uh, or after each author speaks, there will be a very brief opportunity for questions. Uh, there is another session that begins in here at 1230. So we have an hour and 20 minutes from now. And as you know, coming in late for this session, it, 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 there are people who are waiting to get in. So I will, my job as, as um, room host is to be the timekeeper. So I will be um, moving us along as we go. At the end of, the, uh, of this session, there will be an opportunity for these uh, authors to autograph copies of their book uh, down in the area at the bottom of the escalator if you turn left. Uh, that's where the authors will be autographing their books. And now, uh, enjoy the session. Please turn off your cell phones. And now we will have a, um, an introduction for our authors. Thank you. Hello. I'm going to introduce everyone from right to left. That is your right to left. Uh, and we'll do them one at a time. Rick Moody is on your right. Uh, he's the author of four previous novels, The Four Fingers of Death, Purple America, The Ice Storm, and Garden State, as well as award-winning memoirs and multiple collections of short fiction. Moody is the recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship. And his work has been anthologized in Best American Stories, Best American Essays, and the Pushcart Prize Anthology. Hotels of North America, a novel, published by Little Brown and Company as his latest book. Reginald Edward Morse is one of the top reviewers on RateYourLodging.com, where his many reviews reveal more than just details of hotels around the globe. They tell his life story. The puzzle of Reginald's life comes together through the reviews that comment upon his motivational speaking career, the dissolution of his marriage, the separation from his beloved daughter, and his devotion to an amour known only as Kay. But when Reginald disappears, we are left with only the fragments of a life, or at least the life he has carefully constructed, which writer Rick Moody must make sense of. An inventive blurring of the lines between the real and the fabricated, Hotels of North America demonstrates Moody's mastery, ability to push the bounds of the novel itself. So Rick Moody, ladies and gentlemen. It's a really great tie that he's wearing. <laughs> um, this is a work of low comedy, tragic comedy of a kind, but low comedy. So I'm just going right for the jugular with the low comedy. And I made them let me go first because these two awesome American uh, voices are of such seriousness and intensity. <laughs> that I could not have followed them and did not want to, um, you know, get in the way of the beauty that's to come. So I'm going first, this little passage by my uh, fictional hotel reviewer is called Viking Motel, 1236 North Detroit Avenue, Eugene, Oregon, August 15 to 19, 2011. My cousin Dennis asked me if I would consider officiating at his nuptial event, and I agreed and therefore needed to find a way to get myself ordained fast. Now it occurred to me that officiating at weddings was a sideline, a moonlighting gig, not at all dissimilar to my primary business line of motivational speaking. What kind of wedding-related oratory, after all, is not motivational at its core? Just about everything that comes out of your mouth in the nuptial theater inspires and transports. It seemed just and right that I should apply 
to the Infinite Love Church, which is one of those seminaries that asks of you only $18 that will thereafter enable you to carry out the sacred rites of marriage. The Infinite Love Church requests that you read a few rather sugary pamphlets about their ecumenical views, and then they send you an email confirming that you are in law ordained after which you're advised to contact the county clerk wherever you are intending to serve. In this case, the affianced parties were Dennis and his bride-to-be, Olga, of Ukrainian origin. Olga had been in the country since she was seven and had no trace of an accent. She favored brightly colored athletic gear a little on the baggy side as though she were trying to hide a third breast. She had read a lot of Dostoevsky. I learned all of this at a meeting I had with Dennis and Olga, which seemed like something that I ought to do before conducting this nuptial ceremony. If you're officiating and you're trying to seem as though you're an intercessor, that the word of God speaks through you, then you had best meet with the parties concerned. Olga and Dennis came by the motel where I was staying while in town, the Viking Motel. About the women loitering in the parking lot, let me just say, that's youth culture. It was a college town. And let me say too that Dennis did not deserve the long interval he served in the federal penitentiary for transporting copies of stolen material across state lines. And if anyone was capable of being rehabilitated in the penitentiary, it was Dennis, who met Olga while he was there. It was some kind of epistolary romance permitted and facilitated by Dennis's job in the prison library. Dennis was a trembly, nervous person with an island of hair in the front of his forehead, a sort of a saddle horn, if you will, and not much anywhere else around it. He was thin and hunched and resembled one of those dogs that you see in public squares in Eastern European countries. Dennis had not found a way to be comfortable in the world. He seemed as though he were habitually preparing himself for something awful, and this was justified because many awful things had happened. He said it was because he wore that necklace with the human tooth on it that his father had given him. At the Viking Motel, there was a sign on the front of the vinyl-sided cottage that served as reception, and that sign said, back later, see James in housekeeping. I never did see the sign removed. When James did finally turn up after Olga and Dennis stood out in the parking lot, watching women in detachable skirts marching past, he sheepishly admitted that he had blood he needed to wipe up, and the proprietor never appeared at all, which was why Dennis had trouble finding me, neither he nor El Olga having sufficient funds for a cell phone. After I had drunk several bottles of beer, or more, awaiting their appearance, this behavior known as relapse in certain circles, staring at myself in a mirror on the wall by the bathroom that was so large, I began to believe that I could walk into it. There was a knock at the door. Oh, mirror on the wall, who has the beginnings of an irremediable paniculus associated with middle age that no amount of dieting can affect? Who has more body hair than a bonobo. I was wearing only boxer shorts in purple when the knock came. The hip waiters on the cabinet housing the television were for a planned fishing trip in the Cascades, and I was unwilling to dislodge them to get to my corduroys. I, therefore, donned the hip waiters. I could see when I opened the door that Olga was surprised by the outfit. And I begged her to understand that I was an unsurpassed angler and had a suit at the green dry cleaner up the block, as well as a tie 
with a naked woman on the reverse. Dennis knew me well enough not to be surprised, however, and soon the two of them were sitting on the bed somewhat uncomfortably. I poured them pop with some ice from the dispensary out by vending and then sat in the lone chair by the window, still wearing the hip waders, which were not suspended properly on my shoulders. I asked them first of all if their resolve with regard to marriage was earnest and true and characterized by profundities of desire and mutual support. I told them that marriage, as I understood it from my own union come to an end a couple of years before, was a sacred trust and that many people married because they thought they were supposed to marry or because society expected it of them or become, because one of them was with child or simply because they were bored and did not know what else to do with their lives. But I observed that it was possible to do better than this. It was possible to be changed by the revealing light of marriage in proportion to one's development in marriage, in proportion to the amassing of age-related epiphanic moments in the habit of love that is marriage, it was possible, I said, for the beloved to become more ravishing, more perfect, as when ascending into the concentric rings of paradise, and that in marriage we come to find the flaws of the beloved less irksome and instead more delightful and endearing like that weird spinning noise that the beloved sometimes makes when hawking up reserves of toothpaste, for example, or that tendency the beloved has to nervously scratch her ankle over and over again, or how about her wearing two pairs of socks all the time. <laughs> However, as I was saying these things, I looked down. I looked down and I noticed that because of the odd layering of my own garments, that is to say, boxer shorts and hip waders, whose strap had fallen from my shoulder completely, resulting in a sort of bagging of the waders on one side and a riding up of boxers on the other. One portion of the intimate area of my own person was in fact bulging from the side of my boxer shorts, a sack portion of private self. And while some men are modestly sized therein, I was not such a man. It was not unknown to me previously the occasion of this pouch becoming somehow visible Perhaps it was an ongoing problem. And as indeed this was the case now, I quickly looked up, hoping that Olga and Dennis had not glimpsed the bit extruded from the shorts via the falling down and the bunching. Believe me when I say it was a wardrobe malfunction such as only chance can bring about. If I could continuously maintain eye contact during this discussion, perhaps I could imperceptibly move the shorts a bit or the waders through some kind of isometric hip exercise so that a bit of fabric would flap over the testicle and its colony of white hairs. I was driven to ever greater heights of rhetorical fancy in order to assure myself that Olga in particular continued to make eye contact and did not look down. I smiled like a mad person. Any false move or attempt to excuse myself could easily draw her eyes that way. I began looking around the room in the hope that my darting eyes alighting here on the extra large mirror there on the stain on the stuccoed ceiling would likewise seduce away. I asked Olga if the marital relations were satisfactory, if she could assure me that these relations were characterized by gentleness and intimacy and proper frequency. There was a surging of in-breath from Olga, which I worried at first was because she had witnessed 
a little semi-bald protuberance with its four hairs fumbling for recognition. But in fact, I think that the in-breath was owing to the question being a probing and challenging one. And she thought for a while, and then she said that she believed the intimate relations were intimate. And she said, as I recall it, Dennis is a very sensitive man who loves the bodies of women, and I am lucky to have a man like Dennis. Then I asked Dennis if the relations were sufficient from his point of view, and he said, in the time I was inside the penitentiary, I came to believe that I might never again touch the body of a woman, and so yes, love is a holy kind of faith. And here the two of them smiled, bashful smiles of the confederates of love. Next, I asked about money. I said that it was the lot of some people in the world never to figure out the money problem, and there was no shame in this, because love endured beyond money. And did each of them understand this? And was each of them willing to do the working part, the money-making part, if the other was unable physically or for some other reason unemployed, whether because of felony conviction or ADHD? Olga opined that she'd known poverty in Ukraine when it was under the control of the Soviets, and her father had for many years a job as a machinist in which he did nothing at all. He simply showed up at a certain factory and then came home and spent what little he had on Latvian vodka. She certainly hoped that the land of opportunity would have more reward than that. But as long as Dennis loved her and took her to the movies twice per quarter, then it would be okay. After which Dennis said that he had seen the light about trying to make money by transporting stolen goods, and now he simply wanted to be, as he said, legit. And if that meant the loading dock, then the loading dock it was. And again, they looked at one another in the smile. In the middle of the smile, it occurred to me that I could simply swipe the ice container off the tiny lacquered side table by my chair and dash it to the floor. The ensuing mess would direct attention away from the testicle stretching itself languidly on plein air. And I could then rush into the bathroom, perhaps straighten myself up a bit, or at least throw a thin white mildew inflected towel over my midsection. This I did. And I'm sure the swiping motion in which all the ice went flying toward the door did not look terribly realistic. And you can only imagine how distressed Dennis and Olga must have been to think that the man officiating at their service was a hip waiters at night kind of guy. But there was no time to dwell on this because the ice was everywhere and I got down on all fours and began trying to clean it up. Soon Olga was beside me, and I could smell her perfume, which she'd probably put on for just this evening. In our shame, we were close together, she and I. We were investigators of shame, trying to make the most of the moment. And maybe she never saw the testicle at all, nor the slight varicose vein on the bottom of testicle. Maybe she hadn't seen it at all. And I don't know why this hotel is called the Viking Motel. And it leads one to wonder many things about Vikings. They did not last long on this continent for starvation and disease. They quickly headed back to Iceland and Denmark in their devastation, where they could feud with one another and hack one another with axes named Head Splitter and Tree Foe. What the Vikings had to do with the Pacific Northwest, I cannot say, as it's my impression, that no Viking ever lived in the Pacific Northwest. <laughs> Two stars. <laughs> It's a tough act to follow, unfortunately. Um, 
I, I should have introduced myself. I'm Mark Caputo. I'm with Politico, uh, our Florida offices, if anyone's interested. Uh, let's get on to the author. So Mary Gateskill is the author of the story collections Bad Behavior, Because They Wanted To, which was nominated for a Penn Faulkner Award, and Two Girls Fat and Thin. Gateskill's work has appeared in The New Yorker, Harper's Esquire, The Best American Short Stories, and The O. Henry Prize Stories. In The Mare, a novel, Gateskill presents the story of a Dominican girl, the white woman who introduces her to riding, and the horse who changes everything for her. In praise of the novel, Entertainment Weekly writes, Gateskill takes a premise that could have been preachy, sentimental, or simplistic, juxtaposing urban and rural, rich and white, young and poor, oh, I messed that up, young and old, rich and poor, brown and white. And she makes it candid and emotionally complex, spare, real, and deeply affecting. And with that, here's Mary Gateskill. Now for the unrelieved seriousness. <laughs> okay, uh, I'm reading from the beginning of the book you just described. That day, I woke up from a dream the way I always woke up, pressed against my mom's back, my face against her and her turned away. She holding Dante and he holding on to her, his head and her breasts wrapped around each other like they'd fallen down a hole. It was okay. I was an 11-year-old girl, and I didn't need to have my face in my mama's titty no more. That is, if I ever did. Dante, my little brother, was only six. It was summer. The air conditioner was up too high, dripping dirty water on the floor outside the pan I put there to catch it. Too loud, too. But still, I heard a shout from outside, or maybe a shout from my dream. I was dreaming about my grandfather from DR. He was lost in a dark place, like a castle with lots of rooms and rich white people doing scary things in all of them. And my grandfather was somewhere shouting my name. Or maybe it was a shot. I sat up and listened, but there wasn't anything. That day we had to get on a bus and go stay with rich white people for two weeks. We signed up to do this at Puerto Rican Family Services, even though we are not Puerto Rican, we're Dominican. This social worker walked around in little high heels, squishing out of tight pants like she thinks she's a model or something, but with her face frowning like a mask on Halloween. My mom talked to her about how we were in a neighborhood that was all bad negritas, no Spanish people. She told her how she had to work all day and sometimes at night just to keep a roof over our heads. She said it was going to be summer, and I was too old for daycare. And because I was stupid, she couldn't trust me to stay inside and not go around the block talking to men. She laughed when she said this, like me talking to men was so stupid it was funny. But I do not go around talking to men, and I told the social worker that with my face, which made the social worker with her eyes and her mouth tell my mom she's shit, which made me hate the woman even if my mom was lying about me. My mom acted like she didn't see what the social worker said with her eyes and mouth, but I knew she did see. She saw like she always does. But she kept talking and smiling with her hard mouth until the social worker handed her a little book. She stopped then. I looked to see what had shut my mother up. It was pictures of white people on some grass, hugging dark children. MassSpace told us we could go stay with people like this for two weeks. We could swim and ride bicycles and learn about animals. Sounds like hell, whispered Dante. I took the little book out of my mom's hands. It said something about love and having fun. There was a picture of a girl darker than me petting a sheep. There was a picture of a woman with big white legs sitting in a chair with a hat on and a plastic orange flower in her hand, looking like she's waiting for somebody to have fun with. <coughs> My mom doesn't write, so I filled out the forms. Dante just sat there talking to himself, not caring about anything like always. I didn't want him to come with me, bothering me while I was trying to ride a bicycle or something. 
So when they asked how he gets along with people, I wrote, he hits them. <laughs> they asked how he resolves conflict, then I wrote, he hits. It was true anyway. Then my mom asked if we could go to the same family so I could take care of Dante, and Mask Face said, no, it's against the rules. I was glad, and then I felt sorry for saying something bad about Dante for nothing. My mom started to fight about it, and Mask Face said again, it's against the rules. The way she said it was another way of saying, you're shit. And the smell of that shit was starting to fill up the room. I could feel Dante get small inside. He said, I don't want to go be with those people. He said it so soft you could barely hear him. But my mother said, shut up, you ungrateful boy. You're stupid. And the smell got stronger. It covered my mom's head, and she scratched herself like she was trying to brush it off. But she couldn't. And so when we left, she hit Dante on the head and called him stupid some more. Going to this place with sheeps and bicycles had been turned into a punishment. But I still had hope it would be fun. The lady I would stay with had called me to talk to me, and she sounded nice. Her voice was little, like she was scared. She said we were going to ride a Ferris wheel at the county fair and swim at the lake and see horses. She said we were going to ride a Ferris wheel at the county fair. She didn't sound like the lady with the big legs, but that's how I pictured her, with a plastic flower. I thought of that picture and that voice, and I got excited. I got up and went out into the hall and got into the closet where our coats were. I dug in the back and found my things I keep in the old cotton ball box. I took them out through our living room into the kitchen where it was heavy warm from all the hot days so far. I poured orange juice in my favorite glass with purple flowers on it. I took the juice and my box to the open window and leaned out on the ledge. It was so early that there was nobody on the street except a ragged man creeping against a building down below us, holding onto it with one hand like for balance. He was holding the wall where somebody had written cookies in big red paint. That was because this boy called Cookies used to stand there a lot. He was called that because he ate big cookies all the time. He was nice, even though he told me once that even though he liked me, if somebody paid him enough, he would kill me. We stood there talking for a while, and then he broke off a piece of soft cookie he was eating and gave it to Dante. A little while later, a cop killed him for nothing and his name got put on the wall. I took my things out of the box and put them out on the ledge. They looked nice together. A silver bell I got from a prize machine, a plastic orange sun I tore up a get well card somebody gave my mom, a keychain doll with only one leg but wearing a checkered coat, a dried seahorse from DR that my grandfather gave me, and a blue shell my father gave me when I was a baby, and he lived with us. I held the blue shell, shell against my lip and felt how smooth it was. I looked up and saw the sun had put a gold outline on the building across from us. I looked down and saw the ragged man stop against the wall like he was trying to get the strength to breathe. Then he stretched up against the wall, his arms and hands spread out like he was crying on the red paint word. And for a second, everything was hard and clear and pounding beautiful. The last time I saw my father, I was eight, and Dante was four. We had to leave our old apartment, and my mom was staying with a friend and trying to find a new place. So he came and took us to Philadelphia in the car with his friend Manuel. I remember blowing bubbles on the fire escape with these other kids from this woman, Sophia. She had big, soft breasts pushed together in a green dress, and she made asopa with shrimp and mango pudding. I don't think she liked me, but her girls were nice. 
We slept in the same bed and told stories about a disgusting white guy in history who cut people up with a chainsaw and danced around in their skins. Then the littlest girl would rap like, when I woke up in a piece, I don't even gotta speak. I'm a bad mama jamma, goddamn motherfucker, you ain't gotta like me. <laughs> and it made me and Dante laugh, cause she's so little, he's so cute. My father sends Dante a card and a, and a dollar for his birthday sometimes, never me. I put down the shell and picked up the seahorse. I never met my grandfather, but he loved me. He talked to me on the phone, and when I sent him my picture, he said I was beautiful. He told me stories about how bad my mom was when she was little. He sent the seahorse. He said one day my mom would bring me and Dante to visit, and he would take us to the ocean. I remember his voice rough and tired, but mad fun inside. I never saw him, and I almost never talked to him on the phone, but when I did, it was like arms around me. Then his voice started getting more tired, and the fun was far away in him. He said, I'm always going to be with you. Just think of me. I'm there. It scared me. I wanted to say, Grandpa, why are you talking like this? Even in your dreams, he said, I'm there. I said, bless me, Grandfather. And he did. A month later, he died. I put my things back in the box. I looked down in the street. The ragged man was gone. The gold outline on the building was gone too, spread out through the sky, making it shine with invisible light. For some reason, I thought of a TV commercial where like a million butterflies burst out from some shampoo bottle or something. <coughs> I thought of Cookie's face when he gave my brother a cookie. I thought of the big legs lady in the book holding the fake orange flower, looking like she was hoping that somebody would come and have fun with her. Thanks. Last, not least, Elizabeth McCracken. She's the author of an exact replica of a figment of my imagination. The Giant's House, Here's Your Hat, What's Your Hurry, and Niagara Falls all over again. A former public librarian, she's now a faculty member of the University of Texas at Austin. Hook em horns. And she's received numerous awards and numerous organizations, including the American Academy of Arts and Letters, the Guggenheim Foundation, the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study, and the American Academy in Berlin. Her latest book is Thunderstruck and Other Stories, published by the Dial Press. These nine vibrant stories navigate the fra fragile space between love and loneliness. In McCracken's universe, heartache is always interwoven with strange, charmed moments of joy, an unexpected conversation with a small child, the gift of a parrot with a bad French accent. And that all reminds us of the wonder and mystery of being alive. Thunderstruck and other stories shows the inimitable writer working at the full heights of her power. Ladies and gentlemen, Elizabeth McCracken. And, and probably least. Um, I'm so delighted to be here and to be reading with um, Rick and Mary. And uh, I lost my reading glasses and I was looking for a pair outside and a wonderful woman named Pam, I went up to a, to a stall and said, do you have reading glasses? And they said no. And Pam gave me these glasses. So I'm very delighted. Um, I had a really hard time trying to figure out what to read because it's hard to read excerpts from short stories. And I was, two of the stories take place in France and like a lot of people, I'm feeling very tender towards France. And then I realized that if I read those stories, it would require me to pronounce French into a microphone, which is not one of my strengths. 
Um, I, I, the last book of fiction I published was in 2001, uh, and this book came out last year, so there's a big gap, and one of the reasons there was a big gap is that I was extremely busy writing failed novels. Um, I read two of them, and I'm gonna read the start of a story that is from uh, that novel. Um, there are three stories in this collection that are part of the novel, and to let you know what a very bad novel it was, uh, you couldn't, every now and then I, I say that, and somebody says, I'm, oh, I'm gonna guess what stories they are, and nobody has ever guessed correctly. There are no characters in common. It was, uh, it was a bad novel. Um, and this is, and this is the, the first story. I, I pulled the story sort of from the flaming wreckage of the novel. Three days after I had finally decided that I was gonna give up on it, somebody, uh, Michael Ray at uh, um, Zoetrope All Story, sent me an email saying, do you have a short story? And I went, no, but if you give me a week, maybe I can, I can manage to salvage something. And it was, it's this story. Um, and I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna read the start. It's called Some Terpsichore. And it, it's called Some Terpsichore. Terpsichore is the, um, uh, this is not a good reason to call a story this, but uh, it's the muse of dance. And there's a Frank Sinatra song that I've always loved called Come Dance for Me, De Come Dance With Me. And in the middle, he says, it's a perfect evening for some Terpsichore. One. There's a handsaw hanging on the wall of my living room, a house key from a giant's pocket. It's been there a long time. What's your saw for, people ask, and I say, it's not my saw, I never owned a saw. But what's it for? Hanging, I answer. By now, if you took it down, you'd see the ghost of the saw behind, or no, not the ghost, because the blue wallpaper would be dark where the saw had protected it from the sun. Ghosts are pale. So the room is the ghost. The saw is the only thing that's real. These days, though it grieves me to say it, that sounds about right. Two. Here's how I became a singer. 40 years ago, I walked past the Washington Monument in Baltimore and thought, I'll climb that. It was the first thing in the morning. They'd just opened up. As I climbed, I sang with my eyes closed. Summertime, I think it was. Yes, of course it was, summertime. I kept my hand on the iron banister. My feet found the stairs. In my head, I saw myself at a party, leaning on a piano, singing in front of a small audience. I climbed, I sang. I could never remember the words, largely because of a spoonerized version my friend Fred liked to th sing. Tummer sign and the iving is lazy, jiffer fumping and the hiver is wry. <laughs> then a man's voice said, wow. In my memory, he leans against the wall two steps from the top, shouldering a saw like a rifle. But of course, he wouldn't have brought his saw to the Washington Monument. He was a big-boned, raw-faced blonde man with a smashed Parker House roll of a nose, a puny felt hat hanging on the back of his head. His slacks were dark synthetic, snagged. His orange cardigan looked like rusted Brillo. He was so big, you wondered how he could have got up there. Had the tower been built around him? Had he arrived in pieces and been assembled on the spot? <laughs> wow, he said again, and he clasped his hands in front of himself, bouncing on his knees with the syncopated jollification of a love-struck 1930s cartoon character. I expected to see querulous lines of excitement coming off his head, punctuated by exclamation points. He plucked off his hat. His hair looked as if it had been combed with a piece of buttered toast. That was you, he asked. I nodded. Maybe he was some municipal employee charged with keeping the noise down. You sound like a saw, he said. His voice was soft. I thought he might be from the South, like me, though later I found out he just had one of those voices that picked up accents through static electricity. Really, he was from Patterson, New Jersey. A saw, I asked. He nodded. I put my fingers to my throat. I don't know what that means. He held up one of his big hands, still palming his hat. Beautiful, he said, not of this earth. Come with me, I'll show you. Boy, you sure taught George Gershwin a lesson. Where do you sing? Nowhere, I said. 
I couldn't sing, according to my friends. The only person who'd ever said anything nice about my voice was my friend Fred Tibbetts, who claimed that when I was drunk, sometimes I managed to carry a tune. But we drank a lot in those days, and when I was drunk, Fred was too, and sentimental. Still, I secretly believed I could sing. My only evidence was the pleasure that singing brought me. Most common mistake in the world, believing that physical pleasure and virtue are in any way related, directly or indirectly. The man shook his head. No good, he said very seriously. That's rotten. We'll change that. He went to take my hand and instead hung his hat upon it. Then I felt my own hand, his own hand <coughs> squeeze mine through the felt. You'll sing for me, okay? Would you sing for me? You'll sing for me. He led me back down the monument, the hat on my hand, his hand behind it. My wrist began to sweat, but I didn't mind. Of course you'll sing, he said. He went ahead of me, but kept stopping, so I'd half tumble onto the point of his elbow. I know people. I'm from Philadelphia. Well, I live there. I came to Baltimore because a buddy of mine, part of a trio, he broke his arm and needed a guitar player, so there you go. There are 228 steps on this thing. I read it on the plaque. Also, I counted. God, you're a skinny girl. You're like nothing. You're so lovely. No, you are. Don't disagree. I know what I'm talking about. Well, not all the time, but right now I do. I'll play you my saw. Not everyone appreciates it, but you will. What's your name? Once more, oof. We'll change that, have to. You need something short and to the point. Take me. I used to be Gabriel McClonahesham. Now there's a moniker, huh? Now I'm Gabe Macon. For you, I don't know, let me think. Miss Porth. Because you're a chanteuse, that's why the miss. And Porth Kiss, I don't know. And Miss Kiss is just silly. Look at you blush, the human musical saw. There are all sorts of places you can sing. You don't know your own worth. That's your problem. I've known singers, and I've known singers. I heard you, and I thought, there's a voice I could listen to for the rest of my life. I'm not kidding. I don't kid about things like that. I don't kid about music. I was frozen to the spot. Look, still, goosebumps. You rescued me from the tower, Rapunzel. I climbed down on your voice. I'll talk to my friend Jake. I'll talk to this other guy I know. I have a feeling about you. I have a feeling about you. Are you getting as dizzy as me? Maybe it's not the stairs. Do you believe in love at first sight? That's not a line, it's a question. I do, of course I do. Would I ask if I didn't? Because I believe in luck, that's why. We're nearly at the bottom. Poor kid, you never even got to the top. Come on, for 10 cents is a strictly all you can climb monument. We'll go back up, come on, come on. I can sing, I asked him. He looked at me. His eyes were green, with gears of darker green around the pupils. Trust me, he said. Three. I wasn't the sort of girl who'd climb a monument with a strange man, or go back to his hotel room with him, or agree to move to Philadelphia the next day, but I did. His room was on the top floor of the elite hotel, the kind of place you might check into to commit suicide. Toilet down the hall, a sink in the corner of the room, a view of another building with windows exactly across from the elite's windows. Musical saw, said Gabe Macon. He opened a cardboard suitcase that sat at the end of a single bed. First, he took out a long item wrapped in a sheet, a violin bow, then a piece of rosin. You hit it with that, I asked. Hit it? What hit, Gabe said. I thought, look, he said. The saw he'd hung in the closet with his suits. I had thought a musical saw would be a percussion instrument, a xylophone maybe, a marimba. He rosined the bow and sat on a chair in the corner. Saw was just a regular wood saw. He clamped his feet on the end of it and then pulled the bow across the dull edge of the blade. You could hardly see the saw, the handle clamped between his feet, the end of the metal snagged in his hand. He was a pile of a man with a blade at the heart, a man doing violence to something with an unlikely weapon. It was the voice of a beautiful toothache. It was the sound of every enchanted harp, flute, princess turned into a tree in every fairy tale ever written. I sound like that, I said. He nodded, kept playing. I sound like that. It was humiliating, alarming, ugly, exciting. It was like looking at a flattering picture of yourself doing something you wished you hadn't been photographed doing. That's me. He was playing Fly Me to the Moon. He finished and looked at me with those Rube Goldberg eyes. That's you, he said. He flexed the saw back and forth, then dropped it to the ground. 
I picked it up and tried to see my reflection in the metal. You don't take the teeth off. Nope, he said. This is my second saw. Here, give me. I lifted it by the blade and caught it through the, he caught it through the tawny handle. The first one I bought was too good. Short, expensive, wouldn't bend. You need something cheap and with a good length to it. Eight points to an inch, this one. Teeth, I mean. He flexed it. The metal made that backstage thunder noise I imagined when he'd first said I sounded like a saw. This one, though, it's right. He flipped it around and caught it again between his brown shoes and drew the bow against it. He'd turned on just one light by the hotel bed when we'd come into the room. Now, it was dark out. I listened to the saw and looked at the sink in the corner. A spider crawled out of it, tapping one leg in front, musingly, like a blind man with a cane before clambering over the embankment. <coughs> the saw sighed. Me too. Then Gabe reached over with a bow and touched my shoulder. I flinched, as though the horsehair had caught a case of sharp off the saw. That's you, he said again. Maybe I loved Gabe already. What's love at first sight? <coughs> Sorry. What's love at first sight but a bucket thrown over you that smooths out all your previous self-loathing so that you can sell yourself, see yourself slick and matted down and audacious. At least, I believe for the first time that I was capable of being loved. Or maybe I just loved the saw. Thank you. an opportunity for those of you in the audience we have a microphone here in the middle if you would like to ask questions or make comments uh, we have time and you can address any one of the three authors all your readings were very beautiful um, I'd like to hear about how you prepare for your readings I had the pleasure of seeing you in New York as well and I hope you're doing an audiobook I so hope your voice was magnificent on this particular work but I'd like to hear about how you prepare for it and any preparation. Does that make sense? Are you asking me? Um, all three. Go ahead. Um, I didn't hear some of it, but it sounded good. It sounded <laughs> like you were saying something really nice. I think you were saying, you, you were wondering how we prepare to read? Yeah, or, um, say like you're doing a particular passage, or is there, do you, how do you pick the passage, and then how do you, um, intonations and things like that. I thought, you know, um, sort of like um, the, the uh, handiwork that's involved with it, if that makes sense. Uh, I, I do pick pass, I pick, I, if I'm reading from a novel, I prefer to read from the beginning because then you don't have to do a lot of explanation. I really dislike doing that. Um, if I get completely bored out of my mind doing the same thing, which can happen, um, then I really look for something in the, the thing that I think will stand alone with minimal explanation. I really hate it when novelists read things and they jump around, um, read one section and then explain for several minutes what the next section is and then read that for a few minutes and then explain again. And then <laughs> I, I, I don't think it's effective. So I, I definitely choose what I am gonna read and then I'll practice it a lot. I think Rick heard me read this section first a long time ago and it was, it was terrible. It was like the first time I read it and it was, I don't even know how to describe how bad it was, but um, you just have to do it a lot. And there is an audio book made of this, but I'm, I'm not doing the reading. They had th they have four different people. Um, I did do the audio book just now for a, a story collection called Don't Cry, and it was a very humbling and um, illuminating experience. I, I heard this, uh, it's one thing to read one section from something that you practice over and over again, and it's been picked for maximum impact. If you have to, it's very different from reading entire stories four at a time. It's really hard, and I don't know how well I did because it's a whole other thing. And, and also, you hear the work differently. I suddenly realized this is why people think I'm nuts. <laughs> <laughs> it was like it really. I'm not kidding. I'm not trying to. Be, I really thought that this is weird. How I did? Why? Why am I so obsessed with these things? Anyway, that. <laughs> Um, morning readings are a challenge for me because I usually prepare with two glasses of white wine. <laughs> Did not do that this morning. I had scrambled eggs and coffee. Um, 
And I, I mean, I do, I, I also, I, this last night I asked Twitter what to read, um, and Twitter did not, which is my, usually my way for getting good advice, and people said, you know, keep it short, and that was the big advice. Yeah, keep it, don't go on too long, McCracken, just, um, uh, but I, I read my work aloud when I, when I write, sort of, a, a lot, so, uh, but every now and then you see, I, I, I fumbled a, a name because it was a name that I just typed, but I, this may be the first time I've ever read it out loud. So I was like, oh wow, there are a lot of syllables there. I probably should have figured out ahead of time how to, how to pronounce that. What they said. <laughs> Hi, this is for Mary. Um, how did you decide, or what made you want to have the voice of a young Dominican Republic girl in this work? I've read some of your other books that seem more American, contemporary. So what, what drove you to this? What, what drove me to it? Yeah. <laughs> um, I love that word. Um, it, it was an accident. Oh, oh, not an accident exactly, but um, it's a long answer, I'm afraid. But it, uh, I, I was in, quite involved with the Dominican family for years. I, I still know them. Um, I'm planning to see them tomorrow, actually. I'm going to Philadelphia, where they, they, one of them now lives. But um, it, was a, it was a rough time in the, because um, things were, as relationships often can be, rocky. And I was living up at Syracuse at the time. I wasn't living there, but I, I had to, I taught at Syracuse, and I was, um, staying in a rooming house because it wasn't a situation where I had faculty housing. And the person who ran the rooming house always had the tube on, the TV on <clears throat> when you came down the kitchen in the morning. So one morning I stumbled downstairs to make coffee and there was a television on and there was a film clip of Liz Taylor in National Velvet riding across a Technicolor Meadow on a horse. And um, the girl that I knew really did love horses and she was one of these girls, we lived next to a stable and she was one of these girls who gets a feeling of peace and confidence on a horse that's quite extraordinary. I never felt that way about them. I don't, had no feeling especially about horses except for admiring them at a distance. Um, and I looked at that thing and I thought, I really wish there was a movie like this about Maxiel. That, I mean, not her literally, but that there was a girl that she could look at and recognize as looking like her. And I immediately dismissed it because I, I don't write movies. Um, I did try to persuade my agent to, I thought maybe I could write a treatment and somebody could buy it and somebody else could write it. But he said, nobody buys treatments anymore. That's, that's ridiculous. But, but I wrote it anyway and he said, um, you don't know whether you want this to be a Walt Disney story or a very dark story. It's confusing. If you want this to, and I said, oh, I want it to be both. And he said, then you need to write the book. You need to write a young adult novel. And I said, no, I can't do that. And I can't, I don't know anything about horses, I don't ride, I don't know enough about Dominican culture. Um, and I dismissed it for two years, that was 2007. But it kept, images of it kept coming to my mind with a great deal of force and un completely unasked for. I would be in the grocery store or the airport or someplace minding my own business. And I would suddenly get these big pictures in my head of scenes from the book, complete with dialogue which has never happened to me before. And not only did they appear for, for two years, I mean, not constantly, it wasn't like every day, but with some regularity, but I would have a physical reaction to it, like my body would tingle. Uh, that also has never happened before, or if it has, I don't remember it, not with that kind of regularity. And I thought either I was losing my mind or I was having a transfiguring inspiration and I decided to sit down and write it in 2009. I thought, I'll show it to my editor. If she doesn't like it, I'll drop it. I wrote about 50 pages, and she was so enthusiastic, she wanted me to drop what I was working on <clears throat> and start it. That didn't necessarily, um, I mean, I thought she doesn't know very much about Dominican culture or horses <coughs> either. Uh, so I, I didn't have a lot of confidence in writing it. And I had to learn how to ride in order to write it, which was really quite something. Um, took me about four years, and I don't ride very well even, but at least I did learn enough to write the book. But it was, uh, it was a very weird thing. I, I wouldn't say I was driven to it exactly, but compelled. I was compelled to do it.
Any other questions or comments before we? Have you any last words you'd like to say? No, we're finished? No. We're finished. All right, the authors will be downstairs to sign uh, copies of their books. So thank you very much for joining us. And thank you to the authors. <laughs>